know, our shows tonight will bring you back to what may have been the most popular crime melodrama ever. It's one of the top three shows that seem to make everyone's list when the subject of old time radio comes up. Would anyone want to guess how many years The Shadow stayed on the air as we know The Shadow? 25 years. It actually started out, though, in 1930 as an offshoot of a pulp fiction magazine. And The Shadow was just a narrator of crime stories that were appeared in that magazine. He did not become the real Lamont Cranston character until the mid-30s when that wealthy young man about town showed up in the guise of, first one, Orson Welles. He explained in one episode that he had been taught to cloud men's minds by a yogi priest in India. So he also took on a lovely companion, wink, wink, who initially was none other than Agnes Moorhead. Other well-known shadows were Bill Johnstone, who also appeared as the Whistler for a time, and Brett Morrison, often heard on many programs, one of them as a regular on First Nighter. But Orson was the first one. He was only 22 years old and total unknown when he won the audition. His salary was $185 a week. That was a small fortune for a half-hour show that required no rehearsal. Hear that, guys? His agreement, his agreement with the sponsor, Blue Coal, allowed him to go on without as much as a prior peek at his script. He never knew how the show ended until he came to the end. That's Orson. Let's sit back now and pretend we're in a darkened room and be ready to have our minds clouded. Who knows what evil irks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> The shadow, who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago, while in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret, the hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend, Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. In today's drama, Death by Chapter, a would-be writer crosses the thin line beyond which fiction becomes fact and imagine, imagination a murderous reality. The Shadow's exciting adventure begins in just a moment, but first, I'd like to remind you homeowners that right now, when winter is changing into spring, is the most treacherous time of all the year. But you can protect your family's health and save valuable dollars by burning blue coal. It's Pennsylvania's finest anthracite. Order a, that ton from your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. And if you want to read The Adventures of the Shadow in complete novel form, in addition to the numerous detective stories, crime problems, and features, simply write us for your copy of The Shadow magazine absolutely free. Remember, all you have to do is mail a penny postcard to Blue Coal, 120 Broadway, New York City, or to Blue Coal, in care of this station, send for your copy of The Shadow Magazine tonight. And now, The Shadow and the Debt by Chapter. In his swank penthouse office, Chet Hale, editor and publisher of a half a dozen crime and horror magazines, waits impatiently while Lamont Cranston and Margot Lane read the opening chapters of a handwritten manuscript. And as Cranston finishes the last page and hands it to Margot, 
Hale asks, What do you make of it, Cranston? Badly written, but pretty frightening stuff. Where's the rest of the story? The rest hasn't been written, and I think I can tell you why. The handwriting seems to indicate a very disturbed personality. More than that, Margo. This author, Alvin Kane, hasn't finished the story because he's only lived the first three chapters. What makes you think so? Look, Cranston, murder is my business. Fictional murder, that is. I've read and published thousands of murder stories, and I've come to know the difference between a fiction writer making his stuff sound like fact and a crackpot trying to make fact sound like fiction. And you think Kane actually lived this? Started by killing those animals, the cat and the dog that annoyed and frustrated him? Yes, Margo, and he writes about the boy he wanted to kill because he thought the boy was laughing at him. There is a frightening progression in these events, Hale, and it reads more like a diary than a story. That's why I wanted you to see it before I return it. Hale, if you want my advice, I wouldn't return or reject that thing until you've had a chance to find out more about this fellow Kane. Why not? Because I agree this isn't fiction but fact, and Kane is working up to killing a man, and if you reject his brainchild, you could become the material for his next chapter. You could be right. You deal in fiction. I deal in fact. But I rejected the tripe of a thousand screwballs and cranks. There is something more, and you know it or you wouldn't have asked us to come here and read this manuscript. Yes, I'll admit it worries me. What do you suggest? Hold the manuscript for a few days. I'd like to meet the author. Check his neighborhood for a basis for those strangling incidents. What's the address? 10 South Street. That's an old rooming house section. Yes, and be careful you don't become chapter four. Number 10 South Street is one of those gloomy brownstones, Lamont. Just a place to fit the mood of a frustrated writer, Margo. Didn't you and Hale agree that Kane wasn't a writer, but a frustrated man? Sometimes the two go together. Let's ring the doorbell and see. Psst. Kane may not be home. He wrote of spending a lot of time wandering the streets with a chip on his shoulder. Yes, but at night. I only got one room vacant, and I only take in single men. That's all right. We're not looking for a room. And if you're selling something, I don't want any. We're not selling anything. And if it's one of them surveys, I don't know nothing. We're looking for a writer by the name of Alvin Kane. I don't board no writers. Their typewriters make too much noise. This man writes in longhand. And he gave this house as his address. Hmm. Nobody by that name ever gets any mail here. Are you sure? Sure is my name is Megs. I get all the mail that comes and I put it on the hall table for them that rooms here. He might live here under another name and meet the mailman outside. If he did, I'd have heard about it. The mailman's a friend of mine. He stays for a cup of coffee once in a while. What's this cane fellow look like? We don't know. We've never seen him. Miss Meggs? It's Mrs. Meggs. And I'm a respectable widow. And I want a quiet, respectable house with nobody in it using different names. Now, what do you want with this cane? We'd like to talk to him about his manuscript and a couple of incidents in the story. Well, what kind of incidents? A cat and a dog that were killed. I don't allow no cats or dogs in my house. Why, you people from the SPCA? No, and it looks like we might have the wrong address. Well, you sure have. Good day. Lamont, I think that woman was lying. I'm sure she was, and I'm going to prove it. Let's go. Go where? To the district post office to send a special letter 
delivered to Mr. Kane at, at this address, which should be delivered this afternoon. Four o'clock, and there's the mailman, Lamont. Taking our large yellow envelope addressed to Alvin Kane, 10 South Street. He's ringing the doorbell. That's why I sent the largest envelope I could find, so we could watch it delivered from a distance. The door's opening. I wonder if Mrs. Meggs will accept it. If she does, we'll know she was lying about Kane not living in her house. We'll soon know. There's Mrs. Meg at the door now. Yes. And she's signing for the envelope. That proves she lied. What do we do now? Just wait here. Give her time to give it to Kane. Then pay a return call and see what she has to say. What did you put in the envelope, Lamont? Nothing but a blank sheet of paper. Kane can use to start his next chapter of confessions. Oh, but not finish it, I hope. Our job will be to prevent fiction from becoming fact. Manuscript. He sent it back. No, no, there's nothing in the envelope. Nothing but a blank sheet of paper, nothing on it. Somebody's making fun of me. Mrs. Meggs, where are you? Come here. Oh, it, it's you, Mr. Kane. I've been waiting to see you. Some strangers come asking about you. Who came asking about me? Well, I don't know. It was a man and a woman, and, and they didn't give their names. What did they want? Well, they wanted to see you about your story writing. My publisher, my editor, they want more. They want to know about a cat and a dog that were killed. What did you tell them? Nothing. I, I told them you didn't live here, like you asked me, on, on account of the bill collectors and, 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 and your enemies. Did they come before or after this envelope came? Well, before. What's the matter with you? Why are you getting so excited? It's a trick, a trap. You're helping them steal my story, my life story. Oh, I am not. I didn't tell them anything. You're lying. I'll find out what you told them. I'm going to the publisher's office. I'll show them they can't steal my story. And if I find you've been lying to me, you'll be the next to die. sent to a publisher for crime stories who believes the author is confessing to murder, Lamont Cranston and Margot Lane returned to a rooming house whose landlady denied any knowledge of the man who may be reenacting each chapter of the crime. Lamont, do you think that man with the red beard who rushed in and out of here could be our author? It could have been. And that envelope we sent him may have started something. I wonder if the landlady will be more cooperative this time. Oh, oh, it's you two again. Yes, and this time we want to see Mr. Kane. I told you, you told I us he didn't live here, but you accepted a special delivery envelope addressed to him at this house. Well, how do you know that? Because I sent it. And we watched you sign for it from our car parked across the street. Who are you? And what do you want with him? Then you admit he does live here. I ain't saying till you tell me what you want. I told you we want to talk to him about his manuscript. Then he was right. You are from the place he sent his story to. Is he the man with the red beard who just rushed in and out of the house again? Yes, but, but he asked me to say that he didn't live here because he didn't want some bill collectors to find him. 
Did you tell him we'd been here? Oh, yes, yes. A after he got that, that big yellow envelope with nothing in it. Why did you send it? To prove you were lying. Well, I ain't gonna lie for him no more. Why not? What happened? Well, he acted like a crazy man. He said you were from his publisher and that you were trying to steal his story and I was helping you. Had he ever acted like this before? Well, not like that. I mean, he's always been kind of touchy and suspicious of everybody, but he's never been like that before. Did he threaten you? He sure did. He said if he found out I was helping you steal his story, I'd be the next to die. And I've been thinking about calling the cops before he gets back. Back? Back from where? Well, he said he was going to that uh, editor or, or publisher and, and show him that they couldn't steal his life story. <gasps> Good heavens, Lamont. It is a true confession, and he's gone to Hale's office. Where's your phone, Mrs. Meggs? There's a pay phone right there on the wall at the foot of the stairs. Do you have a dime, Lamont? Look in your handbag, Margot. I don't have any small change. Well, I hope I have. But, but doesn't Hale leave his office at 4.30? Yes, but he and some of the editors sometimes stay later for story conferences. Can't you find a dime or two nickels? Oh, not a one, Lamont. Don't you have a private phone, Mrs. Meggs? No, I don't. On account of my rumors would always be sneaking in and using it. Well, go see if you can find two nickels or a dime. All right, but you'll have to pay me back. This is none of my business. It may be your life and the lives of others. Hurry! All right, but if you ask me, he, he ought to be arrested. She's right, Lamont. He sounds really dangerous. Granted, Margot, but he's done nothing the police could hold him five minutes for. Couldn't he just be held for observation? Not unless he blew his top in the presence of the police. And we can't count on that. Hurry, Miss Meggs! I'm looking. Lamont, why don't you drive to Hale's office? Maybe you can beat Kane there and warn them that he's coming. I'll stay here and phone if Mrs. Meggs finds some change. That's an idea, Margot. At any rate, wait here. Get all you can out of Mrs. Meggs, and I'll call you at this number the minute I get to Hale's office. Where's the editor, miss? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Hale has gone for the day. Where is my story? I'm sorry. I'm only Mr. Hill's secretary, and I, I don't have anything to do with the manuscript submitted to us. I want my story. You're trying to steal it. Uh, we don't steal stories. If, you're, isn't, if you are not acceptable, it will be sent back to you by mail if you sent return postage. You sent me a yellow envelope with nothing in it. We did not. You sent somebody to find out if my story was true. Uh, we don't print true stories. I want my story. There's no one here who can give it to I you. want my story. I'll see if there's anyone. Uh, no, uh, you don't. You're going to tell someone to hide it. There's no one else here. I'll go see if I can find it on Mr. Hale's desk. I'll go with you. Nobody's going to steal my story. No, please, wait here. I'll see. Uh, uh, what is your name? Kane. Alvin Kane. Oh! You know my name. You know about my story. You're trying to steal it before it's finished. The phone. I'll have to answer it. No. We'll get my story. It may be Mr. Hale. He'll want to talk to you about your story. Maybe he'll buy it. It's a trick. You answer it. I'll get the story for you. No. You wait. Please let me go! Shut up! Hello? Is Mr. Hale's secretary there? Who wants her? Margot Lane. It's urgent. What do you want? Could I talk to his secretary? It's important. No, she's busy. 
Are you Alvin Kane? Yes, why? It's about your wonderful story. We want to talk to you about buying it. You want to buy it, Miss Lane? Print it with my name on it? Yes, yes. Where are you? At your rooming house. We've been looking for you. You wait there. I'll get my story and come back. No, no, it's too valuable. It's locked in a safe. Mr. Hale's secretary can't get it for you, but we know all about it. We'll buy it, but we want to know what you're going to do in the next chapter. That depends. Come back to Mrs. Meggs. We'll talk about it. I want to talk to the editor, Mr. Hale. He'll be here and tell his secretary to ask Mr. Cranston to come to Mrs. Meggs as soon as he can. Who's Cranston? He's, um, <clears throat> uh, he's our crime specialist. Have Mr. Hale's secretary tell Mr. Cranston to hurry and we'll have a, um, a story conference. A story conference? You wait, I'll come. You tell Cranston to hurry over to Mrs. Meggs. Y yes. Uh, tell, I'll tell Mr. Cranston. Ah! <laughs> Hello? Anyone here? Oh, oh, oh. Good grief. Miss Reed? Mr. Cranston, oh. Uh, <clears throat> has Kane been here? Yes. What happened? He wanted to see Mr. Hill. He wanted his manuscript. I, I, I think he would have killed me if Miss Lane hadn't phoned. Talk to him. What did she say to him? She, uh, she persuaded him to go back to Mrs. Meggs. Good grief. How? She said she'd be there, talk to him about buying his story, and I was to tell you to hurry to Mrs. Beggs. Can I call outside on this phone? Yes. It's a night line. You can dial. Did Kane strike you? No. I was so frightened when he ran out. I just fainted. I'm sorry. I shouldn't wonder. He beat me here. Must have taken a cab. I left Miss Lane to call here. Warn you. But she must have realized your danger. Yes. Yes. And she persuaded him to leave. Said Mr. Hill would be there. And you, you are the crime specialist. He would a, come for a story conference. A story conference? Come on, Margo, answer the phone. Kay may be taking another cab. How long has he been gone? I don't know. I was too surprised and frightened to notice the time. And then I fainted. Just a minute. Lamont? Margo, get out of that house and take Ms. Meggs with you. But Lamont... Don't argue. Kane beat me here to Hale's office, and you may take a cab back to Ms. Meg's. Is Mr. Hale's secretary all right? Yes. Your story conference bait may have saved her life. Now get out of there and meet me on the corner, but don't let Kane see Mrs. Meg's. Shall I call the police? He still hasn't committed a crime they can hold him for. Now, get out before I have to call Commissioner Weston and report a homicide. <laughs> Meantime, here is a message of particular importance to all you families. Because the blue crawl burns down to a fine powdered ash, it is not only an economical fuel, but a particularly clean fuel as well. Furthermore, blue coal is an American product, mined in Pennsylvania by the Glen Alden Coal Company. Unlike a good many other fuels, blue coal prepared exclusively for home use, so that you can be sure of getting more uniform, more economical heat. Blue coal is that color, so you can identify it at a glance. So take a tip from the blue coal family and switch to blue coal tomorrow. Ask for it by name. 
Order a trial ton from your nearest blue coal dealer, whose name will be found in the where to buy section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. Now, back to the shadow. Tracking down a would-be author who seems to be living his crime story as he writes it, chapter by chapter, Lamont Cranston finds Margot Lane waiting for him near the rooming house where the writer lives. Lamont, I thought you'd never get here. Rush hour traffic held me up. Where's Mrs. Meigs? She wouldn't leave her house. She said if Kane made any trouble, she'd beat him to a pulp and call the cops. So she still thinks he's a harmless guy writing imaginary stories of his crimes. She said she doesn't care what he is, and she's going to be there to get her rent out of him before anyone takes him away. Have you seen anyone with a red beard go into number 10? Yes, just a few minutes ago. What are we going to do? You're going in that drugstore and phone Commissioner Weston. Tell him what we know and what we suspect. What are you going to do? The Shadow is going to have a story conference with that greedy landlady and Alvin Kane. Don't lie to me, Mrs. Meggs. That lane woman said she'd wait for me. The editor is coming and so is a crime specialist. And we're going to have a story conference. She left and she wanted me to go too. And don't you call me a liar. And don't you bust my furniture. And you pay the rent you owe me and you get out of here. I'll get out as soon as they bought my story. I'll live in a penthouse and have lots of money. And then nobody will laugh at me. <laughs> Well, I'll start laughing as soon as I get my back rent. You'll be sorry if you do. I'm sorry I even let you get a week behind. And you'll pay me now, or I'll go up and lock your room so you can't skip out with that junk you call clothes. You, you deadbeat. Don't you dare call me a deadbeat, or you'll be... <laughs> That'll be my editor. Perhaps his associate, the crime specialist. Oh, and maybe a psychiatrist. Send them up to my room. I'll receive them in my den. Den it is, where you'll be laughing like a hyena or a mad dog, baying at the moon. Bzz. Bzz. All right, all right, quit wearing out my bell. I'm coming. What are you? Oh, them kids again. Ringing and running and hiding in and. Oh, you keep away from my bell, you little brats. You come back and I'll take a broom to you. <laughs> come back in your house, Mrs. Meggs. No children rang your bell. Who said that? The shadow, Mrs. Meggs. How'd you get in my house? Through this open door. Where are you? Who closed my door? I don't see nobody. No one sees the shadow, Mrs. Meggs. For I have the power to cloud your greedy mind. So listen carefully to what I have to say. I'm a, I'm a listening. What do you want? I want to know if your rumor Alvin Kane is still in this house. Well, yeah. He just run up to his room thinking you were his editor. What room? Well, the top floor rear. The cheapest room I got. And he ain't paid up for that. You'll be paid, Mrs. Meggs. Well, that's what he said when I just told him to pay up and get out. You're lucky you didn't pay with your life. Now get out of this house, Mrs. Meggs. Leave Alvin Kane to the shadow. I won't. You ain't real. I, I, I'm just hearing things. I'm no. To the shadow. Oh, something, something touched me. But, but there's nobody, and nobody's gonna believe me. I'm getting out of this house. It's haunted. 
<laughs> I must get ready. I must think what to tell them about my next chapter, what I'm going to do, as if I'd already done it. Why don't they come? If that Mrs. Meg sent them away, I'll kill her! That's it. My next chapter. Meg's the greedy old... Yes, just a moment. Uh, come in, gentlemen. Uh, you must pardon my poor artist's quarters, it's but It's often you... close to madness, Kane. Who knocked? <laughs> Who spoke? Who laughed? It's too late to lock your door against the shadow. Shadow? Don't bother to look around the room, Kane. No man can see the shadow. Who are you? Why are you here? I've come to your story conference, Kane. My story conference? You want to buy my story? I want to hear your story. The next chapter. What you plan to do. I know what's going to happen. More exciting things than in the beginning. What kind of things? Our first only little things died. A cat? A dog? Yes. Did you really kill them? Yes. Why? They belonged next door. They barked and yowled, kept me awake nights. I caught them. Killed them. That started it. Are you going to kill more cats and dogs, Kane? No. That isn't exciting enough for a story. People only get a thrill out of reading about people killing people. Have you selected your victim? Yes. Mrs. Meggs, my landlady. Why? She's a greedy old woman, and she laughs at me. Is that reason enough to kill someone, even in a story? It doesn't matter. It's my story, and I can make it happen. How? <laughs> Mrs. Meggs is a big, powerful woman. She could throw you out of this house. No, she can't. I have something that will shut her mouth, make her quit laughing at me. Where did you get that gun, Kane? I bought it in a pawn shop. Do you have a permit for it? No, and it doesn't matter. It will matter to the police when they come and find you with that gun in your possession, Kane. They won't find me. I'll kill Megs and get away and hide. The police would find you. I'll kill the police and get away, and then there'd be more chapters. No, Kane. This is the last chapter entitled, Alvin Kane Meets the Shadow. I'll kill you, Shadow, if you try to stop me. No, you don't. Nobody will stop me. You'll only leave this room in a straitjacket. The police and psychiatrists will write the remaining chapters of your life. <laughs> No, Lamont, even with Kane arrested for illegal possession of that gun and held for observation, this case worries me. Why, Margot? I have quite a lot of friends and acquaintances who are crime writers, and they all want you to read their stuff, but most of them are rather touchy about criticism. <laughs> most of them are milk toasts. Who wouldn't actually kill a fly? But suppose I catch one of them sticking pins in flies. <laughs> Then you'd better watch them carefully. Good heavens, I know one that's well on the way. How so? He collects butterflies and sticks them on a board. <laughs> With pins! Listen again next week, same time, same station, when the shadow will demonstrate that the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. 
The Shadow Knows. <laughs> Tonight's shadow mystery, Lamont Cranston, as well as the invisible voice that clouded men's minds so you could not see him, was that of Andre Dixon. <laughs> While the role of the lovely Margot Lane was our lovely Judy Marsh. <laughs> Chet Hale, the magazine publisher, was played by Herb Thompson. And his poor secretary, frightened out of her wits, was Nellie Brennan. The neurotic author, Alan Kane, was Jay Summerfield. He asked us not to call it a typecasting, by the way. <laughs> Mrs. Meggs, the acerbic old landlady, was acted by someone who, as a manner, is not acerbic or old, <laughs> Donna Amosmeyer. <laughs> At the keyboard was Mary Ann Sadelek and our <laughs> And our sound effects department was none other than Tom Lynn. <laughs> Announcer for this part of the evening is yours truly, John Shefsky. <laughs> Please continue to stay tuned to your ne next broadcast, which will follow shortly. We pause now for station identification. This is WRTRPN, the Riverside Township Radio Players Network.